bird, my absolute favorite of all favorite insects. This is a jumping spider, the Salticids. And you know, they have a brain weight to body mass ratio that is very similar to ours. And funny that their brain weight to body mass ratio is how intelligence is measured. Now this little guy is inside here, crawled inside this leaf. There you go, I want to open him up there for you. They make these little silken cocoons inside these leaves. And they are actually capable of hunting, believe it or not. These spiders hunt. They hunt like leopard and tigers and lion. Have a look at that. Now, the brain of this particular spider extends almost that entire cephalothorax. He's actually watching me, speaking at him at the moment, trying to hide. You can actually see those eyebrow sparks of his lowering. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's awesome. Now, those two huge eyes that he has in front there are actually give him binocular vision and let them judge distance, and that's how they're capable of... Look at the gold color. It's actually what caught my eye, is these are the only jumping spiders I've ever seen other than birds and a beetle, the jewel beetles that have gold. Have a look at the gold on that particular spider. Do you find that absolutely amazing? Now they can bite. They don't have any venom that can hurt us. You've just seen Brian's huge backpack. Oh, let me just move my thumb out of the way so that he's not that terrified. I'll move him away. There he goes. Now they jump from one plant to another looking for other spiders. They are carnivorous uh, on spiders or cannibalistic and believe it or not they can learn how to hunt different things. They can learn how to hunt different species of spider, different species of ant, different species of insect and they learn from every mistake and they can adapt their hunting technique to adapt to whatever their surroundings uh, are dictating so they can memorize where a prey species is and approach from cover. I just find them absolutely fascinating. The Salticids, they are some of the, well, they are the largest family of spiders that we have out here. They're the most numerous spider that we have out here. This is one of the largest, this gold colored Salticid with those four black dots on its head. We find them singly out in these open grass fields. I found quite a lot of them this year in actual fact. And this is obviously this little spider's retreat for the evening. And we bumped down. I actually watched him go into it. Have a look at that. Having a good look at you, the same as what you looking at him. That is so awesome. Now, he's probably a male Sorry, it's probably a female. She is probably a female. And I'm saying that because she lacks the, the pity palps of a male. Now there she goes into a retreat. I'm going to put her back where we found her, which was by this bush. Ooh, this cranky hip of mine is definitely not made for sitting like that. I'm going to put her back where we found her, which was right here. She's going to spend the rest of the evening very camouflaged in her little silk retreat and she'll come out tomorrow when it's nice and warm, crawl on top of the branch, get some sun, warm herself up and then get ready for her day's hunting. But if you ever want to see some interesting things, definitely go and YouTube or Google yourself the jumping spiders and go and have a look at how many fascinating videos there are out there of these little spiders hunting and learning their different prey and learning their different areas. It's actually keep you going for hours, or well, it does me at least anyway. I quite enjoy these little things. Right, now it's coming to that time of the day where we need to start making our way back not the way we came, we passed some buffalo earlier on, we passed a herd of elephants on the way back. We've also got this big drainage line that we need to go through. We're going to be weaving our way through this open woodland that we're in at the moment, almost parkland. And then we're going to get ourselves into a position where we can scan basically the drainage line in front of us, just to make sure that we're not going to walk into anything. While we do that, James in the tent is going to give you some updates on something he's got. Well, update-wise, it's difficult to tell you that anything different has happened since we were last here. Jandre, of course, has been knocking about the place. You may notice that my face is now bathed in light from all angles. 
Well done, Jean-André. He's hung about. Well, I think we're probably consuming as much power in this tent as the aluminium smelter down at Richards Bay. Uh, what I did want to show you, however, was this piece of pottery. Now, this piece of pottery, I like to say piece of pottery regularly. It's a good thing to say piece of pottery. was probably found in a termite mound close to where Brent Leo Smith yeah, grew up as a small child. It's difficult to imagine him as a small child, but he was once, believe it or not. And it was either used as a kill. Now, I've heard various uh, sort of um, various reports as to how and why you find these pots in termite mounds. And I found a complete one once, which I left where the reserve where I was working. Now, you can see the it's definitely been fired, this this sort of clay so it's clay that's been fired and you can tell that I think from the fact that there's black marking there and if I turn it slightly so that Kurt can get a look at it here you can see that there's black there and I think that comes from it being fired it almost looks like it was fired from within so that will make the clay much harder than it would have been when it was made into the pot now you find them in termite mounds, and I've heard various reports as to why this should happen. I've heard that people buried them in termite mounds as a sort of banking place. They know that a termite mound is hard, that if you don't put it in a place where an artifact can get to, then it's a pretty safe place to keep your money. I don't really believe that. I think that's absolute rubbish. Uh, but I have heard that you might have put, say, a, an offering to the ancestors. Uh, if Maybe you buried a, a member of the family somewhere near the termite mound and you would have put an offering to the ancestors perhaps in this pot which would have been about that big probably quite a large pot and put that in the mound I've also heard and this is what Brent thinks this one was found was found in a termite mound that was used as a kiln now we know that termite mounds make very good ovens so they retain heat very nicely and they're obviously easy to dig into a position where you can sort of put a fire underneath and then have another layer where you can bake bread if you like, or in perhaps in this case, uh, bake a little bit of clay. Now that would have then been used to carry milk from some cattle or some goats. It may well have been used to carry a bit of honey if the person who made it was very lucky and managed to find a beehive. And it perhaps also could have been used to carry water. Now remember water is an extremely limiting nutrient out here. And if you want to find water, you've got to be able to carry it. In the Kalahari, people used to use ostrich eggs. Out here, they would have had to use fired clay if they wanted to take water away from where they lived, which I think is all rather interesting. Let's put these back here. Now, Aaron, in New Zealand, you asked me a very nice question, and it's a pertinent one for what we're looking at now. And it's... I suppose my favourite... You want to know what my favourite part of studying in the bush is? It's interaction, I think, between different things. There's so many fascinating aspects, but for me, it's human interaction with the bush, with the wild. It's our ancient human interactions with the wild. And so seeing things like these clay bits and pieces and the hand axe I showed you, I just think are absolutely fascinating. And I'd love to know the history of these funny little pieces of clay, who put them where they were, what they used them for, how they felt, were they in fact even Homo sapiens? Perhaps there was some other kind of Homo. You know, we're very, uh, these were definitely Homo sapiens because clay won't last that long. So they're probably maybe up to 100 or so, maybe 200 years old. But, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me that there were so many different kinds of hominid or hominin, which are our human ancestors or human relatives that knocked about here and into Europe. Some of whom, or one of whom at least, the Neanderthals had a brain at least as big as ours. So it would be fascinating to know, you know, the stories behind these pots and behind our human ancestry and perhaps even there were human uh, ancestors that could speak and may have had their stories around campfires in the same way that we do in this very area and that interests me very much. Let's head across to, uh, I think we're going back to the lions, which um, I see a whisker moving quickly. very much sleeping. However, I feel as though today patience is the key to seeing these lions on the move. I just have a feeling that if we leave, we are not going to find them again, or we're going to struggle to find them again. However, 
we have repositioned and we found ourselves the perfect spot to start having a look at the magnificence that is the structure of a lion. With this camera we can get not right up close but we can certainly see the best parts of the lions starting with those incredible faces of there and cat let's start and Bradford you were wondering while we watch her face and her eye and her ears twitching in response to the flies you were wondering is that an annoyance to the lions that when she's chasing them away or is it an almost natural reaction? It's difficult to tell. So I think personally a lot of that is instinctive. If they had to drive themselves crazy with the actions of the flies, they would be exceptionally irritable all the time. So I think a lot of that is instinctive. However, lions do get irritated by flies. And I have seen it myself. Very often they snap at them and often will retreat in places where there's really huge amounts of tsetse flies and other nasty biting flies. The lions even retreat up into the trees. So I'm thinking places like Eastern Africa. First of all, it's the coolest spot. And also, it's a nice vantage point in an area that has a completely different habitat to the style of vegetation that we have here, which provides plenty of shade and cover. So the answer Bradford is that I'm not a hundred percent sure I think a lot of it is just that instinctive response to the stimulus of the hair around the ears but I do think that when they are plagued by flies it does irritate them but I mean if we have a look at at some point when we have a closer look at her shoulder and her chest you can see she's absolutely covered there the, dif the difference is that she, the fur in that area is not as sensitive. Look at it, I mean, she's covered in them. She's also got ticks there and some of the larger species of flies. Doesn't look comfortable, but it doesn't seem to be bothering her when they're around in that area. It's more in her facial region where she's got extrasensory nerves that it, she finds it a bit more irritating. And since Amber Eyes isn't showing us her gorgeous eye colour, however, she is presenting us with a nice contrast here. Have a look at the two lionesses facing us, and then have a look at Amber Eyes. You get a sort of an idea of the contrast of the difference in colour. So there's that light white belly, and then as Amber Eyes... Oh! <laughs> Bless you. That's what I meant when I said that they, every now and again they inhale <laughs> the flies and <laughs> have to have a bit of a sneezing fit to get rid of them. Oh, shame girl. They're driving you mad. <laughs> what I was going to say is just look how that black of the ear stands out in comparison to the other side of the lion's body. I can hear elephants. I know they're coming. Where can I hear these elephants? I'm actually hearing them all around me. Sorry, we'll get back to the black colour in a moment. Oh, there. That's why I can hear elephants. <laughs> Here's an elephant. Now, oh, things could get a little bit more interesting once they spot the lions. The wind has died down. Earlier, that wind it's still blowing their scent in that direction, but earlier the wind would have sent the smell straight across to that elephant. Hmm. I can actually also hear elephants, I think, unless it's just my earpiece affecting the directional hearing, but I think there's also some somewhere towards the Galago pan, but I can't see them. The lioness is not concerned in any way. Any big, big grey shapes there? No. Well, this could be an interesting sighting. I'll keep an eye on the elephants, wait and see if they decide to come a little bit closer. 
They will want to go, there's a good chance they want to go towards the Galago Pan to go and have a drink. This isn't your usual pathway though. They like to move down towards the DRC and then take a path from there. It remains to be seen. We had a lovely elephant sighting this afternoon in between drives where an Eddie bull came right up and stood outside of the house munching away quite peacefully and very much appreciating the calm of the afternoon and not in any way shape or form bothered by us moving about. It's amazing how elephants know where to expect people and where not to. This looks like one young bull. Don't see any more. We'll keep an eye on him. Very often the young bulls are taunted into chasing lions even faster than the older, more mature ones. First of all, because they feel more vulnerable than the larger, fully, or the, the sort of the bigger males that have been on their own for extended periods of time. But also because young male elephants actually really want to prove to themselves and to the world that they are big and scary. And they often do that by taking it out, chasing buffalo, hippos, lions especially. They will come and chase. But I think in this case we might see them miss each other. His general direction looks more like he might go and visit Mr. Hendry at the tent rather than the lions. <laughs> Just some trees moving in the background on the left of your screen. Yep. Well, we'll keep an eye on him. I don't think he is the only elephant here. And if he gets a little bit closer, then we will be able to show you a nice clear view. While our lionesses sleep on, back to James, and I wonder whether he's got any more animals moving about in his vicinity. There don't seem to be any animals wandering about quarantine at all, so what I'm doing is attempting to take a photograph of the sun, which of course my mother uh, detests deeply, but uh, I do feel that it's necessary every so often to take a picture of the sun, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill my shutter speed slightly and take a picture of the sun, which will be particularly unentertaining to anybody but myself. But you know, at least I will then have a memory. There is my brilliant photograph. What do you think there? Are you, are you, right. are you amazed? Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. Now, we're looking here, uh, we're obviously in the bush, there is nothing stopping animals coming here, and Cat in Tampa, you say you're worried, or are we worried about monkeys and elephants coming to tamper with things here? Monkeys, I would be a little bit worried about, baboons as well, they certainly were roosting in the tree just outside there this morning, and they came leaping out as we set up at the fireside, so I'd be worried about them. And were they to come in here, uh, baboons, of course, are dreadful trashers of places. They are gangs, and they come into an area, and basically they go to the loo absolutely everywhere they can. So those I would be worried about. But we close the place up. Elephants would come and sniff around here, and there would be almost certainly no reason for them to push over the tent or have a go at it at all. Now, the one other thing I want to show you, now I know many of you will have seen this before, but it is such a special thing to see. Look at this giraffe skull. Eh. And this is a big bull giraffe. I'm not going to tell you too much about him, otherwise I'm going to run out of things to tell you the next time we're here. But what I can tell you, remember, <coughs> we showed you the occipital condyle, remember that lovely term, they're on the hyena, and there it is on the giraffe. And if we compare the two, you can see that the occipital condyle, now I'm going to just have to check this up, but I'm pretty sure I'm accurate here. It might, I may have the wrong joint, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. You can see that the occipital condyle on the hyena is a lot rounder than that on the giraffe. And I think that that's probably because it has this ability to articulate 180 degrees. The giraffe can bend this joint 180 degrees, whereas the hyena only through 90 degrees. So that's what I have to tell you about that particular thing. And then have a look at the dentition. 
Oh dear, bits and pieces are falling out of this thing. This, of course, has remained in camp since its last was in the tent. And just look at the flat edges of the teeth. Now, I think that this giraffe was probably quite old when it died. You can see that the teeth are not particularly flat. Here's one, I think, from a buffalo. You see that one there? Now, that's a lot flatter on the edge because obviously the buffalo was a bit younger when he met his end, probably at the teeth and claws of some lions. This guy may have died of old age. Very few things die of old age out here, but it's possible it died of old age. But you can see from the continual chewing that a ruminant must make, remember these teeth grow almost until the animal dies, they have to keep chewing and chewing and chewing because eating vegetation is not something that provides a great deal of nutrition, despite what vegetarians will tell you. Uh, it's difficult to get uh, nutrients out of vegetation. And so these grinding teeth are massively important for breaking down the cellular walls, which are made of cellulose and lignin, and that breaks up the cell walls and releases the nutrients that vegetarians and herbivores, like this rather heavy giraffe, are able to eat. There we go there. And let's have a look here. Just have a look at this water buck here. And Nisa, you're in North Carolina and you're wondering about Nigel the Nyala. Now, Nisa, this is why I'm showing you this particular chap here. You can see some of the sinew is still on this water buck and he was not perfectly cleaned. I went to check on Nigel briefly the, just recently, about sort of half an hour ago. He's in a pit with a whole lot of flesh-eating beetles. I think they're called Dermetris beetles. And the beetles are certainly there, and they're certainly giving it a go. But I've got to tell you, Nigel smells horrific, and he certainly doesn't seem like they're doing a very good job of cleaning him. So I'm going to leave him for another five days or so, and if he is not clean by then, I'm going to have to take him out and boil him and take to him with a steel brush and a toothbrush, which will be, well, very unpleasant. And I might make Jerry do it, because Jerry needs something to do, don't you, Jerry? Mm. She's not looking amused at all. Jerry's very busy at the moment, but uh, I'll ask her to help me very kindly. Anyway, that's about all I have to tell you at this stage of the game. Let's just have one last look at the setting sun. There it is, you can see, going down behind to the north. Now, when we were here in Big Cat Week, of course, we had the sun going down over there. Unbelievable how far it has moved. And, of course, we're heading towards the middle of June, or the middle of winter, whereupon it will turn and come back towards that area. Right, Jamie is still sitting with those lionesses. <sighs> One of them just moved its paw. Let's go and look. Oh, high action here. She moved her paw to a more comfortable position. She's now found a more comfortable position. And that, I think, concludes the movement for the next few moments. And since we are sitting here and waiting for them to get up and move, which I think that they are going to do, I figured I'd take the opportunity to just provide you with an extract from the Stevenson Hamilton book that I inherited from my grandfather. So for those of you who missed it, Stevenson Hamilton was the very first warden and one of the men who was instrumental in the formation of the Kruger National Park, which has just recently celebrated its 90th birthday party. However, he was, he was sort of around the Kruger National Park, which was then the Sabi Nature Reserve, much earlier than that. So in the early 90s, even in the early 1920s, when he started the process of turning it into a protected area. Not an easy job, and initially, the, the idea was to hunt and kill all of the predators. That was the, that was the understanding of conservation at that time, was get rid of the predators so that the general game population will increase. Zero understanding at that point, or at least very little understanding, as to exactly how the ecosystem really truly works. Now this book was written in 1943, or at least published in 1943, so right towards the end of his tenure in the Kruger National Park and also towards the end of his life. It was published in Skakuza, which is now the sort of the main camp of the Kruger National Park, but was initially his home for many, many years. Some of the things are absolutely spot on, and some of the extracts are truly hilarious to read. This is one on the lion. It's chapter 19, entitled 
the lion, pursuit of prey. <laughs> it says, taking him all together, because for some reason it has to be a him and not them, all together, the lion is a good-natured, lazy creature, well there you go, seldom seeking trouble, and so long as he is well fed, quite content to live and let live. The other animals know this quite well and instinctively realize that when a party of lions may be regarded or as safe, it is not at all an uncommon sight to see a herd of zebra or wildebeest gaze, grazing quite unconcernedly within 150 yards of where lions are lying asleep in full view. Indeed, were Leo only a vegetarian, he would no doubt be one of the most amiable of all wild animals. But nature has decreed that he be a flesh eater, and that unless he can obtain his natural food, which must necessarily be at the expense of the lives of other animals, he must himself die. Hence his unpopularity, but it is hardly his own fault. He seldom kills except when he is hungry, and is far less bloodthirsty than any of the weasel tribe, or than the ordinary domestic cat. There you go. I think reading between the lines there, Stevenson Hamilton, possibly not entirely a domestic cat van. That was a highly entertaining extract. I like the, I like the idea that if nature had decreed that the lions were vegetarian, they would be the most well-liked and amiable of creatures. It's an interesting perspective of things. Um, and then they will bully and will kill other members of the cat tribe when opportunity offers. <laughs> I once found a spot where three of them had lain up for the day close to where a female serval had made her lair. The lions killed all three kittens seemingly in sheer mischief as they had not eaten them. So you can see the dots starting to form and our understanding starting to get clearer of the way in which lions interact with other animal species. They, they don't kill unless they are hungry and that's partly due to sleepiness and also to do with the fact that they overheat so incredibly quickly and the hunting when you are this size takes a tremendous amount of energy. Just an interesting little perspective into the understanding of lions 60 years ago, more than 60 years ago at this point. Back over to Bushwalk because I think that they may well be running out of light at this point and might soon be heading home. You know, Jamie talking about Stevenson Hamilton is really just such a fantastic reminder that there's just such a deep sort of heritage to these areas and so many people that through the ages and through their lives have had such a massive contribution to, uh, to the bush. I, I fondly remember my first tracker that I really had a bond with. Back in those days, we had just changed, South Africa had just changed from, um, from the bad apartheid years into a new democracy. And I'd met this African fellow named Richard Ndubani, a local guy. He was uh, uh, in his 50s already at that stage. He just gave me such a massive respect for the bush, such a massive uh, helping hand in my guiding career. To this day, I revere him. He's unfortunately passed on uh, and he's buried not too far from where I'm standing at the moment and I love to know that I'm close to where he is, walking around where he walked around as a young boy and it's just really quite a nostalgic moment, I must be honest. But something that I've just figured out on a lighter note at least, something that I've just figured out is that these terminalia trees smell, oh, they smell like fresh rain. I don't know why I've never smelt one before but they are that smell that you get from fresh, fresh rain, that is exactly what this tree smells like. Oh, and it's such a fantastic smell. <laughs> but, <coughs> come and have a look here, Brian. I want to show you what this is. And hopefully, because Brian is coming here. Now, of course, because I want to show you, it's disappeared. There was a Katie did, a bark like Katie did here. I wonder if me smelling this branch hasn't chased it away, but I want to see if I can find it again. It was literally part of the stick. I promise I haven't inhaled it. Let's see if we can see it here. It probably flew away while I was busy doing my reminiscing for you. But we are running out of light, as you can see. And we are moving from being 
observers in the bush to being a little bit more ingrained in the food chain where we are at the moment. <laughs> Something that you don't really want to be in the bush is lost in the dark. This is around about the time that if you were in a, in a wilderness area, you would have already made camp a long time ago, have a decent fire going. We're not too far away from camp, we're probably about a mile away from camp where we're standing at the moment. And uh, we're going to be making our way slowly back to camp. We're going to cross very close to, to James probably by the time we finally get to quarantine. And then we definitely are going out tomorrow morning again. Well, that's if everything works. You never know the little gremlins that visit our camp from time to time. Definitely might have other plans for the bushwalk tomorrow morning. But nevertheless, we're going to endeavor to go out with you there. And uh, are we busy walking down here? I want to see if we can find one last little thing to show you. And I always enjoy, like, set a challenge, you know, like, l walk up to the closest bush you can, stick your face into it and see exactly what you can pull out of it. This is a grevia bush. Ah, we've got a... Mitch, you have asked a very good question. Do we find ticks on ourselves after bushwalk? Can I tell you something? I'm covered in tick bites, literally from the top of my, end of my toe to the top of my head. Luckily this time of the year, those cold snaps that we're getting make the tick bites slightly less. I can show you though the after effects of ticks. There we go. Some of the tick bites. Those are all scars from tick bites. All those, I know it doesn't look too appealing. Please excuse me for doing that. Let me hide my disgustingness from you again. But this is a rus, and on these ruses this year we found these beetles. These are flea beetles. Now I speak often about these flea beetles to be honest. We're just going to find one for you, one that we can show. Um, there's one hiding in the corner there. There we go. In the center of your screen is a little flea beetle. They have been feeding on these rus plants this year. There you can see its big back leg where it gets its name from. Now. These flea beetles are only found out live in the Sabi sands literally this year. We found one in the sand at my feet one day. Found out it was a flea beetle because it jumped off of my, off my hand using those enormously developed back legs that you can see in the center of the screen there. They really are quite astounding beetles. They can jump a good, I don't know, two hands, two feet away from, not quite two feet, one foot away from where I'm standing now. They are now coming to the end of the breeding season. I haven't seen them mating with each other yet. That doesn't mean anything though. They could mate at night time. But what they're going to do is very soon drop off the trees, bury themselves about 30 centimeters, which is about a foot into the ground. And there they're going to lay some eggs, which will pupate for the winter. And towards the end of winter, which is around for us, around about September, October, the bushmen that would have lived in this area and who do utilize these plants for this particular grub will dig at the base of these trees. We'll take out this little pupa, it's a little worm, and then they'll squeeze the worm, the juices out of the worm. And that caterpillar has been collecting toxins that has been really synthesized from its parent in these particular plants throughout the winter. And those toxins will then be used to coat arrowheads and spear points, not this point, but just the shaft behind the point. And they will use that then to hunt with. Now they don't, the Bushmen were chased out of this area probably a couple of hundred years ago um, by the African people that moved into this area who are a little bit more advanced. And they fled into the Kalahari, but they took this particular skill with them. And you find the flea beetles in the Kalahari as well. And I was lucky enough to spend some time with some real Bushmen in the Mkhari Khari Pans in Botswana. I'll tell you, it was two of the most favorite days of my life. And they harvested some of these beetles for me. They then juiced the beetle, is what I like to call it. They juiced the beetle and they kept the juice in a little container. It was a little horn container. And the, the, the bushman that was with me said they'd go home and heat it slowly and condense it. Take the water and the moisture out of this particular grub's poison. And it turns it quite sticky. And then they coat their arrows with this condensed uh, uh, poison. And if they shoot that into the neck or the cheek, the neck of a large antelope, kudu, um, I suppose Irland is their favorite, but even something as big as a buffalo, they would kill something that weighs as much as 1,600 pound. They can kill it in 40 minutes. Can you believe it? Something that comes from this little beetle. I can't speak enough about them actually. This one is right here. And there we go. 
one of the last times we'll probably be showing you these little flea beetles this year. They'll come out again next year. Here we go. And I'm going to use the opportunity as well to say goodbye from myself and Brian. We may see you for one last segment depending on how quickly we get to quarantine. I doubt it though. So from myself and Brian at least, we're going to say goodnight and we'll hopefully see you again in the morning or just now depending on how quickly we get to quarantine. Anyway, have a good day for the rest of it wherever you are. Now, I hope he doesn't run too, too, too fast towards quarantine clearings because I don't know where he is, but there's an elephant whose ears you might just be able to see flapping past where my chest is. And there's a bull there. And we were talking briefly earlier about monkeys and elephants and whether we were worried about the effect that they may or may not have on the tent. Well, he hasn't come near us, and he won't come near us while we are making a bit of a noise. And, you know, they've got bright lights in the tent now, and so he won't come near us. But I know you can't, see, you can't actually see the elephant at the moment. He walks so beautifully out into the open. Let's give him a few seconds and just see if he doesn't pop out into the open. I'm not sure which direction Steph is going to come from. I think he walked from back there, but I don't think he's anywhere near where that elephant is. We're going to give him one minute to see if he can't come out and while he does I'll just talk to you about this grass species. <laughs> Omar, this is a very good question while we wait for this element, elephant to come out. You're asking about why it is that many of the herbivore species don't fight with each other when clearly as you look around this clearing there's so very little for them to all share in. Here, can you see the flapping ears? Nobody's going to believe that I've actually got an elephant there. Anyway, he is there, I promise. Omar, they don't fight because quite often they eat totally different parts of the plants. So if we take an example of wildebeest and zebra, wildebeest eat shorter grass than zebra, and so that's often why you find a herd of wildebeest being trailed, at least a herd of zebra uh, being trailed by a herd of wildebeest. Impala, in turn, would then eat even shorter grass. Warthogs would eat the grass closest to the ground and they'll even dig up the roots and the sort of underground stems of grass species. So they're not in direct competition. And what is important for you to understand, uh, this elephant is not playing the ball. Oh, here he comes. Here he is. He's moving slightly towards us. If he comes up behind me, do warn me, everyone. What's important to understand is that animals evolve in such a way as to avoid competition. That's the whole kind of it's one of the major drivers of what we call natural selection and the ability to separate what we call the trophic niche or what you eat so you don't want to evolve into a species that eats exactly the same as something else otherwise there's not going to be enough for you to eat. So only two animals are able to reach more than three meters into the air to get food and that's the giraffe and the elephant but of course they seek out different foods. Giraffe and elephant can reach as high as each other and um, they eat, giraffe will only eat the leaves, but of course elephants will eat fruit, they'll eat uh, bark, they'll eat branches, and they'll eat grass. And if we take the example of, let's say, kudu and bushbuck, well they two are very closely related, they're both browsers, but because of the size difference, they eat different levels of vegetation, and therefore they're not in direct competition. And you'll find that their size difference has probably been largely defined by the, the chance or attempt to try and um, to try and avoid food competition with each other. Wonderful to see this elephant here and of course if you have an office like mine here uh, on quarantine clearings this is what you can see out the front of your office. It's midwinter. I'm standing very warmly. I've got a little jersey on because I'm not very thick of flesh but it's just the most perfect perfect way to end a day. Imagine you could look at like this sort of thing from your office window. Coming towards us everybody, an astonishing sighting of three primates. Behold, the mystic boer, scout, herbert and of course the giraffe-like figure of Brian Joubert walking with an even more giraffe-like uh, sort of antenna on his back. He looks like something out of a science fiction movie, doesn't he? Especially with his <laughs> his knee-length gaiters, which of course on the most of us would be like full-length boots. Hello everybody!
We are live. There is an elephant. Let's look back at the elephant. <laughs> and he's just coming out quite nicely into the open now. Have you got a good view of him? Wonderful stuff. And just very gently feeding through the evening, picking up bits of grass, bits of leaves, and twigs, and Omar, he'll be eating things that nobody else will eat. And I just think that that is one of the most amazing things of nature, isn't it? I can smell the gentle smoke of wood fire as the day comes to an end. And as the day comes to an end for us, so the night begins for animals like the lions with Jamie. Well, it sounds as though the tent is in a magical position, stiff on one side, elephants on the other. And for us, the dire predictions that they were going to be up and about has not yet proved to be 100% true. However, however, they have afforded us some wonderful images of their cuddle time together, wrapped around each other, the two lionesses with their paws, one resting her head, no longer on the elephant dung, but on the other female's paws, looking exceptionally content. There is, in fact, you can't see it from your perspective, but there is a zebra. Oh, oh <laughs> nothing like a couple of feet to the throat, too. Oh, big stretch. <laughs> They're surprisingly tolerant of each other today. Sometimes when lionesses overstep the personal boundary, they get a bit of a snarl or a hiss. Not today. Today, I think they're just grateful to have been reunited once again. Now, what I was going to say is that there is, in fact, a zebra, probably about 60 to 70 meters into the bush. Unfortunately, you can't see them from our perspective. Now, it's a little bit further into the bush. The lions haven't realized that it's there. And I don't think that the zebra has realized that they are there either. It's unfortunately, I don't want to reposition to get a view of it because at the moment I'm not even sure that I could. It's only because I'm slightly lower than, than VM that I can actually see them or see it. Uh, we've been speaking a bit about the lioness's fly plague. And it's getting a bit better now that it's got cooler and dark. There's not as many of them around the lioness's fur. And we have an interesting question from James Dungan as to... Oh, okay. Lots around there. As to whether there are any plants that could be used as a fly repellent so that the lionesses could maybe roll around in and that would keep the flies from settling on them. It's an interesting question, and I'm not entirely sure. I don't know of any, so we've often spoken before about potential fly remedies when we've been driving around in the summer months, trying to figure out exactly what we can do to keep ourselves from the flies. And a lot of the cameramen wrap their faces up in buffs and try and keep the flies, but they climb in to the buff itself. They go up our noses, they climb into our hair, so we've kind of been through the different natural remedy options. Steph's was my absolute favorite. Steph, when I first started working here, Steph seems to be, he does, he does collect the flies quite a lot. And because he never wears a cap, they're always fluttering around his head and that must be infuriating. What Steph did was he drilled holes in a big coffee can and put elephant dung in there and drove around whilst he'd lit the elephant dung and he drove around with a smoking elephant dung <laughs> to try and keep the flies at bay. I still don't know if it worked. I'm not sure Steph would tell us if it didn't work, but it was highly entertaining to witness. As to whether or not there's any kind of leaf or plant that we could crush or that they could crush that would keep the flies from settling, that's actually not something that I'm aware of, and, and the lions certainly don't know of anything, to the best of our knowledge. They sometimes roll in scattering dung. I just want to see who's approaching here. 
Well, somebody might have been trying to get hold of me on the Game Drive channel. Nope. I think it's just, just going past. Uh, it's interesting because we know that elephants know certain trees. <laughs> Certain, which trees to use in order to keep sore teeth at bay and it could well be that they are aware of the pain killing properties of some trees but as far as I know <laughs> oh so comfortable as far as I know the lions are not aware of any such remedy that might assist them in keeping the flies away. In fact, I don't know that lions are instinctively aware of any kind of medicinal properties, except the absolute basics. Oh, that's a sign that movement might be on the cards. A big yawn. If they start to lick their feet, we might be seeing some action before the sunset drive draws to a close. So lions will eat grass if they're feeling a bit queasy, much like pet dogs and cats at home. But I, I'm not aware of them knowing any kind of other medicinal treatments. So here we go, another yawn. It's usually amber eyes that initiates the movement. So the lioness that's at the back, and she looks as though she is absolutely in the depths of sleep. She's definitely not looking like she's going anywhere at the present time. What do you say, girls? Is it time to get up yet? Thinking about it. Yeah, those incredible teeth showing through. Now, since they do sleep as much as they do before they get up, Sid, you were wondering whether they have higher melatonin levels and let's just check here let's check that spot on her belly right in the middle no no don't oh girl don't move your leg we need to just have a look and see i'm not a hundred percent convinced that i've seen suckle marks today sorry sid i'll get back to your question in a moment it's just because she presented us with that view i'm just not sure i don't know why that's the case Maybe we have made a mistake about that lioness denning, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, it seems so unlikely. Her behavior fit the behavior of a, a lioness that had just given birth perfectly. Well, something's disturbed the dogs closer to camp. Hello, girl. Is it nearly time to be up and about? Thinking about it. Ah, yes, giving Amber Eyes a good kick. That might convince her. Sorry, Sid. You were wondering about lions and their melatonin levels, since they sleep as much as they do, and you were wondering if they have a high melatonin level. I have honestly no idea. My instinctive response is proportionately not much higher than human beings. But I'm not 100% sure why I feel that way. Oh, another big yawn. <laughs> another one or are we yep another one giving us a view of those incredible canines now while they think about getting up and amber eyes gets kicked into action Let's go back to James, who is doing his favorite thing in pretending to be a form of primate. Those lions ain't doing nothing for some time. I don't know why they're so lazy. Now, I know that many of you know that I like to be in a tree every so often. And yes, I suppose that might be likened to some of our well, what some might term more primitive primate cousins. But the reason I'm in this tree is because there were some primates in this tree this morning. There were a whole lot of baboons. Now, 
how, I was just trying to discover how on earth they managed to sleep soundly in this tree, their balance must be something incredible. Because, I mean, a big male baboon's about the same size as I am. I'm not a big human, but for a baboon I'd be quite big. And, I mean, there's really not a lot of space to sit up here. I mean, I suppose I could sit like that. Oh, but that's very uncomfortable, I have to tell you. I might sort of lie against a branch like that, but I mean, I'd be liable to fall out at some stage during the night. So I don't know how they manage it. And thankfully, in this particular tree, it's not a regular roost, so they haven't made any sort of landmine deposits. Um, and the smell is fairly fresh still. But what I want, did want to show you was when they became aware of us, during the course of the morning and they started to panic, many of them, the youngsters especially, and they came bucketing down the tree at a substantially faster pace than I am going to come bucketing out of this tree and they jumped, the first one that we saw, jumped from where I am now. Now there's no ways you could get me to jump out of this tree from here. I would definitely break both of my legs and possibly one of my arms and almost certainly my back. So their flexibility and strength is quite incredible and it never ceases to amaze me, I must say, how adept physically most of the animals are out here, especially when compared with our feeble human frames. Now the one thing, of course, that a human being is able to do better than almost any other animal is an endurance sport. And <laughs> I'm getting that horrible feeling when you get stuck. I'm getting only 6 out of 10 for my dismount. Well, I'm not down yet. Kirsten, give me a chance. Being really good at. We are the only species that I know of that are able to run distances like uh, sort of marathons and longer, double marathons. Everybody knows about the Iron Man and those amazing distances that people run there. <laughs> I might be stuck. I might have to hang from here and then drop. <laughs> Jerry, do you think I'm going to break something? Six and a half I get from the final control. Anyway, that was my baboon segment and I'm going to try desperately to see that. Seem like I'm not out of breath, but in actual fact, I really am. One last thing before we go back into the tent. Have a look at this last golden inflorescence of grass. Now this is the sword-toothed love grass, Erogrostis superba. And it used to be sort of pinkish green and now it has turned gold as the winter has come upon us. Let's wander back towards the tent and you can have a look at it from the outside. That's what it looks like from the outside. These are our cable wranglers. Geraldine, Chelsea, don't mess around girls, come now. This is a very serious business. And this is the tent. To give you an idea of how this kind of works technically is that, well, the cable wranglers are obviously following <laughs> Gert. We're not wireless like the rest of the feeds are. And we go straight into that box there, and that box goes straight to the final control. And the big advantage of that, of course, is that there is no delay at all. So, as I speak, so it is that you're hearing us. And there are the feeds, and hopefully Connor will be sitting in the far end there with his drone. Let's go back in and see what else we can find. Connor, at the moment, is sitting in final control. And he, of course, is the hungriest human being anyone's ever met. And Kirsten says he's having his first dinner. He'll have his second dinner with the rest of us <laughs> at about 7 o'clock, I imagine. Here is a Hoppy Pussfoot over here. Hello, Hoppy. Hello. And uh, <laughs> we're back in here now. I'm just checking what the lions are doing. Oh, I see one of them is yawning and sticking its tongue out. Quickly go and have a look. Perfect timing. One of them was indeed yawning, the other's flicking, and the other has left completely and moved off straight towards James and on quarantine. <laughs> so, James, 
Just be keeping an eye out from a leopard coming from the Gallego shortcut side. I've stayed with these two. The lioness that got up was the lioness in the middle. She looked particularly hungry. She's got the two, in, the sort of the two spots on the bottom of her nose. And I can confirm when she stood up, she does not have suckle marks. So she has not given birth recently. The lioness that has just walked away. Now that leaves Amber Eyes and this female. Amber Eyes we know is not heavily, heavily pregnant. She might be pregnant, but she's not heavily pregnant. So is this the lioness that we suspect of denning? Oh, already alarm calls. Why did that lioness move off on her own? Or is she waiting for them to catch up with her? Here comes Amber Eyes. She's also hungry. Relatively empty belly, big feline stretch. Oh, I see. Bit of grooming before the hunt. Let me nibble that tick for you, my dear. She really does stand out. more affection, begging for grooming or hinting in a not so subtle way that she wouldn't mind a couple of good licks before they head out. Yep, yeah, right there, that's the spot. Likely bigger in terms of the size of her head. Oh, there we go. That, that grooming session freely offered. Oh, and judging by those, where those alarm calls are, these lionesses are about to lead us through one of the thickest blocks out here. Unless she's walking up for your telemain access. Oh, look at that face. They've heard the alarm calls as well. I don't think they realized how far the other lioness had gone ahead of them. A lioness on the right showing a, a degree of reluctance but amber eyes fiercely attentive and ready to set up on the morning oh, sorry evening hunt oh <laughs> that was the best flop ever Lazy and playful. See how quickly they go from relaxed to this alert stance. I'm going to take my spotlight off. It's interesting, she's changed direction as to where she went. Oh, and we're down again. <laughs> it's amazing. Flop. I'd love to know how they know what's going on. That shouting from the impala tells us immediately where the other lioness is. echoing through the cold evening air and yet these two know that they don't need to get up that the chase is over before it even began take my spotlight off them for a moment. There's, the light will still be on. I just want to check what is happening behind me. Here she comes, she's coming back. <laughs> she realized that she was left all alone. I suspected that might have been the case. 
<laughs> Guys, I thought you were following. Get up, you lazy lions. Okay, she's going to come round and straight back to them, I think. I'll just keep an eye on her for now. Is she going to come walking next to us or is she going to go to behind them? I think she's going to go behind. There we go. <laughs> Somewhat of an aborted start for the lioness. She wanted to go hunting. Her, the rest of her pride mates did not. She's going to walk right behind the vehicle. Sorry, I'm going to go this side. <laughs> you guys were right behind me. greeting ceremony. I'm going to go, I'm actually going to reposition, I'm going to go backwards ever so slightly because where they're lying now you can get a better view of the third lioness at the same time. While I reposition, Sandy, you were wondering whether a sister lioness or a mother maybe, just to extend that slightly, far as I can go, I guess not, would ever go and help a denning lioness catch food since obviously it must be harder for a single mom to go and sort herself out while during the time of her pregnant or during the time of the first few weeks of her cub's birth and it does happen so that I don't know necessarily that she's it's a conscious decision to go and help but when the lionesses are in the area, then they will meet up with the mother or she will actively seek them out. And they will spend time together, first of all doing this, which is reaffirming their bonds. Plus, you know, getting rid of the old pesky tick. And at the same time, she'll be able to go hunting with them. She'll have increased chances of success. Or she might even go and join them at a kill site and then return to her den later. So cubs can be left on their own for up to 24 hours, sometimes even longer, depending on where, how desperate the mother is for food. And sometimes she will leave them and cover enormous distances. But yes, it is difficult. Which is why new mothers, new female lions that have had cubs, often look relatively thin. They struggle to find food, plus provide for the cubs themselves. It's going to be quiet for a moment so you can hear the sound of the tongues rasping, or hopefully you can. She got excited, shame, she's so hungry. But there's just Amber Eyes getting up to relieve herself. She's trying once again. The lioness, the young lioness with the twin spots is trying once again to lead the lionesses on. Okay, let's let down to one. Amber Eyes has taken the bait. Come on, girl. Everybody wants to go except you. I know you're very comfortable. I'm just taking my light off her for now. Here, did you go? Okay. Amber eyes and the twin spot female 
making their way towards the road. They're right behind Vium at the moment, or at least a little bit too far for him to be able to show you. I'm just trying to keep an eye on three lionesses at once. So I wonder if they haven't got something planned. But two of them looking particularly hungry. This lioness, to me, didn't strike me as as hungry as the other two. But I haven't seen her stand up yet. It's hard to gauge when they're lying down. We wait for her to decide whether or not it's time to stand up and start moving. Let's get back to James and see what he's up to. I'm much the same as you, everybody. I am looking at the screen and I can see that I am a safari guide and I can see what my name is. Both, of course, were very timely reminders at this time of the day. I can also see that those lions have done absolutely next to nothing one of them listening into the night. Anyway, what I thought I would show you is a horn, and this is a Nyala horn of a Nyala bull, obviously, because the cows don't have horns. It's a very old one, and it gave me a splinter in my finger, which was very sore, and it's still very sore. Anyway, that's not why I wanted to show it to you. What I wanted to show you here is the top of the skull. And I want you to try and get a picture or an idea of the size of a Nyala's brain. Now, understand that a Nyala basically, well, I mean, they, they weigh roughly the same as human beings. Females probably sort of 45 to 50 kilograms. And if you multiply that by 2.2, you get about 110 pounds. So roughly the same as your average, si average to small sized lady. And then the males up to well, 90 kilograms and maybe 100 in the really big ones. And that's about 220 pounds, so about the same size as a human being. Now, their brain is about the size of my fist. You can see that my fist will fit into the brain case of the Nyala. Now, what I think is so interesting about that, of course, well, about that big. So, I mean, it would fit. It, it's smaller than an apple. It's about an apple-sized well, apple brain. That's all that is driving a Nyala. Now, if you compare it to us, of course, our brains are much, much bigger than that, up to 1,800 cubic centimeters. That's 1.8 uh, liters, which in gallons, no, can't do it in gallons. I might be able to do it in quarts for you. Yes, I can. Stand by. It's about, it's about two and a half quarts is our, is our brain case and much larger than this one, which cannot be more than, say, 300 millimeters, milliliters, if that. So, I mean, what's that? It's less than half a quart. So maybe a third of a quart at absolute maximum. And yet, this animal survives completely successfully. And we like to think of the fact that, you know, our brains are so big and therefore we must be a slightly more evolved species. And that's not true. All it means is that a small brain is enough to make this Nyala a completely successful antelope uh, and successful animal on planet Earth. And just we, our big brains are absolutely necessary for our lifestyles. But for the lifestyle that this Nyala species has chosen, obviously unconsciously, to live, this tiny little brain, which is the size of a good-sized plum or a very small withered apple, that's all it needs. And that's one of the ra major reasons that their gestation period is so much shorter than ours, despite being an animal that weighs the same, and that their youngsters wean so much faster and develop so much more quickly than ours do. One of the things that ha one of the great disadvantages of having a brain roughly the size of a human being's mine, of course, isn't very big, but in most people, about a thousand eight hundred cubic centimeters. One of the great difficulties of having a brain that size is that it takes a very long time for all the neurological pathways to connect with each other, for the brain to develop, to be able to function properly. And you know how long it takes a kid to learn to speak, how it takes us 13 years until we're independent. Well, I mean, I know that that's in prehistory these days, as I've said before. Some males only go independent at roughly age 40. But our ancient human ancestors, of course, would have been independent at puberty, which would have been at about 13 years. This Nyala, at the same size and mass as us, thought I could hear an elephant, but it's a car, um, 
will be independent and breeding by the time it's three and a half years old. And I just think that that's an utterly astonishing fact when you think about it. Anyway, we're the only thing with a brain as big as ours. And so let's put him back over here. And let's hope, I suspect very strongly, that this Nyala was the victim of one of these lions. The lions you're about to see, they've got up. Can you believe it? They're actually moving. Go and have a look. They are moving indeed and they took the opportunity to, or at least one of them took the opportunity to evacuate her bowels. Oh, that's quite pungent. That is not enjoyable at all. Oh. <laughs> it's just wafting over us in waves. Oh. Okay, so we're going into incredibly thick, dense vegetation here now. As you know, we've had enough problems with our vehicles as it is. Oh good, she's adding to our old factory assault. As you know, we are currently down two vehicles, Jigger and Wendy. They are in for repairs. Uh, we're going to be leaving the lionesses to move in through this block, unfortunately, just because they have chosen the worst possible route that they could go. What I'm going to try and do is loop them instead and hopefully pick them up on the other side. Maybe they're heading towards Voyatella main access, but we won't be trying to stay with them for now. Oh my goodness. I don't want to leave you with your your last shot of the lions for the evening being that particular one. But we'll try and we'll try and get another view of them for you when they when we loop around. There we go, that's a bit more dignified. Okay. Right, let's go. I'm not going to I know this block of old, I know that there are no secret routes through there. We're going to have to do it the long way, and so we shall. While we turn around and try and relocate our lionesses, after three hours of waiting for them to move, they went in exactly the direction I was hoping they wouldn't. Chitra, you were wondering if we've ever observed conflict within between lionesses, particularly within a pride itself. And the answer is yes, very frequently, but especially when it comes to meal times. The lionesses love each other very, very much, right up to the point at which it comes time for them to feed. Especially if they're hungry, and these lionesses are hungry, they give each other some very solid growling, they they often snap and bite at each other. The lion is not a gentle creature when it comes home. Oh, I think a, I think a truck has lost its load here. Oh dear. Oh whoa. Mainly because it's in my way. Hmm? Quite a big one. It's quite a big one, and I feel like I'm about to snap it if I drive over it. Yeah, we have to go the other way around. Wood's quite expensive. I don't, don't want to stop to grab it and put it. I don't have anywhere to put it at the moment. <laughs> so Chitra, yes. I have also encountered conflict or seen conflict between two prides that may or may not have been related, but that definitely didn't appreciate the presence of the other. And apparently the, the Inkahumas actually gave the sticks quite a beating at one point, and not so long ago, before the sticks had their cubs. Oh, Rusty, we need to take, check your steering fluid. Oh, there we go. I have a feeling those lionesses are going to pop out just up ahead. I'm hoping that's going to be the case. Now, in terms of other conflict, so conflict not connected to feeding, for the most part, lionesses are relatively peaceable. Sometimes when they are, they've just returned from mating, they're a bit more, a bit grumpier than they might otherwise be and less tolerant of another lioness lying right on top of them or something similar. So what we witnessed today, sometimes they're really just not in the mood 
and the presence of another lioness lying right on top of them will make them growl and snap and just be generally irritable. But the truth is you just never know what to expect for them, but their bonds between lionesses of the same pride are exceptionally strong. Oh, there's another plank of wood. Whoopsie daisy. Maybe it's just an obstacle course laid down specially for me to make sure I'm watching the road at the same time. <laughs> We've got to, got to tie things on the back of a truck. Oh look, there's another one. <laughs> Somebody is going to be in trouble. Oh dear. Whoops. I sympathize because after my town trip yesterday, oh, <laughs> planks of wood that have fallen off the back of a construction. Oh, and we've got another one. Oh, they really didn't tie this down at all. Whoopsie daisy, somebody's in trouble. Oh, dear. oh, and another one. All right, what was that? That's about seven or eight that have been dropped. I wonder at what point they're going to realize that they've been tossing planks out into the road. But yes, I sympathize because yesterday on the town trip when I was collecting numerous pieces of steel and wood, there were some worrying moments. In terms, oh, oh no, this is the most disastrous of all. Oh no. <laughs> all right, we're going to focus now on finding these lions while we do. Back to James so that he can say goodbye to you all for now. What a very fascinating drive, uh, Jamie's having there spotting planks on the road. Excellent. I see that I am still James Hendry Safari Guide, and that is greatly comforting to know that I am what I and who I thought I was at the beginning and the end of the drive. Now, Brentley Smith gave me this collection of things, and there were, of course, with the lion claws, there's a crocodile tooth that was split in half that I shall tell you about at some other stage. There it is there. And there's a uh, small sort of stone tool used by a prehistoric human. And then there's an assortment of rubbish, uh, some of which is uh, money. That's very nice, which I shall keep, not give back to him. And um, some kind of fishing lure. Now, of course, Brent Leo Smith, you must ask him about fishing. He's a very passionate fisherman. I don't think that this is going to catch any fish anymore. Anyway, I just thought I'd show you all of the things that we're investigating. There's also a moth, which uh, he definitely didn't put in there. This hapless and totally uh, mo devoid of colour moth died some time ago seeking shelter in Brent's collection of little artefacts. Riveting, riveting stuff, everybody. Now, we're going to say goodbye to you. I am going to hand you back to Jamie for the last sort of bit of the drive. It remains to, I don't know where those lions went. I wasn't watching very carefully. Obviously, she was distracted by the astounding beauty of those fence poles that were on the road. And so she was unable to keep up with the lions. Anyway, I'm going to let her tell you about that for the last three minutes. I hope you've had a nice time here in the tent. A big thank you to her. Thank you, her, for your efforts today. Cheesecake. Greeny. And, of course, Pussfoot, who is standing behind us here. Hopefully, we're going to send him to the doctor tomorrow. And the next time we show you his foot, it won't look like he is a battlefield casualty that has not had medical attention for some years. Uh, in <laughs> we, we, we will see you in the morning. I'm not sure if I'll be on a car or in here tomorrow morning. I hope you have a lovely evening wherever you are. Stay safe and happy, and we'll hand you back to Jamie and hopefully a road. Well, unfortunately, whilst I did see where the lions went, and I didn't allow myself to be distract distracted by the presence of those planks in the road, the lionesses, it appears, have given us the slip and moved into this very dense block. Unfortunately, following them in there was just at this point just out of the question but we shall catch up with them tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari hopefully they have managed to catch something in the interim 
Those two lionesses in particular were looking as though they could use a very good meal. And I also don't want to go crashing through there whilst they're trying to search for something to hunt either. I don't want to disrupt them in any way. So we'll leave them be for now and we'll return at the start of the sunrise safari. Oh, I'm going to do all this plank dodging now. It's ridiculous. This poor chap has lost probably about 20 planks of wood. But yes, we will return on the, on the start of the sunset. Sun, no, goodness, sorry. Sunrise safari to see if we can't figure out exactly where they went during the night. But keep an eye on the Juma Dam camera. I'm not 100% con convinced I saw suckle marks. But hopefully they, that female will decide to return. I'm not sure. I'm second guessing this denning situation now. But we'll see. We'll have to wait until the sunrise safari to confirm. And Catherine's absolutely right. The lioness is up and about. It's regular, like clockwork. Waking up and heading out into the evening for a night of active hunting. And we wish them all the best for that. Hopefully they succeed at some point. Well, draw now to the end of a fantastic sunset safari. It's time for us to say our goodbyes and thank yous. Most especially thank you to Viam for his fantastic camera work as always and his company during our lion sighting. And to Kirsty, Rebecca, Lou and Jerry in final control, the lovely ladies keeping the team together. Welcome back to Rebecca and Lou. And most importantly, thank you to all of you for your fantastic questions, conversations and your company. We'll catch you tomorrow. In the meantime, have a wonderful day and we'll see you then. Bye-bye.